are new and have not been on one yet. Uh, like Jesse said, my name is Colby Hales and um, originally from Laramie, Wyoming, and uh, currently I'm the Ag Teacher and FFA Advisor at Pinedale High School. Uh, my education background, to keep it uh, rather brief, um, went to Casper College and got an associate's degree in animal science, and then from there uh, went to Colorado State University and got my degree in agriculture education. And then uh, once I was done with that, uh, currently, or not, well, yes, currently, I guess, still, uh, I'm, I'm finishing my master's through the University of Wyoming uh, in animal nutrition, specifically ruminant nutrition. And so uh, tonight, hopefully, it'll be kind of fun. Uh, I, I, I nerd out over ruminant nutrition. I think ruminants are the coolest beast known to mankind. And so uh, hopefully, uh, I can portray that with, with what we go over tonight. So uh, it should be a pretty good, pretty good little lecture here tonight. And I guess really quick, just before you dive in, um, I will be recording this session um, and putting it on my YouTube channel like I've done with the previous three sessions. Um, and those uh, three out of, I, or I guess the other three should be available now. I'm still adding the closed captioning on uh, the last one there, but this one should be up tomorrow. Um, and if you guys would like me to email you those links, um, Put your email in the chat box and I can uh, go ahead and do that. Um, also along the same notes, if you guys uh, have questions throughout this presentation, uh, please feel free to ask them. Um, Colby has always been uh, a very interactive teacher and he really thrives well off of questions. So if you have questions during the session, please put them through the chat box. Sometimes it gets a little hard if we're unmuting and um, asking questions verbally, but uh, we've, we would love to hear what questions you do have. So please utilize that chat box as much as you want. Um, and I guess, oh, on that same note, again, if you guys wouldn't mind, um, just for my, uh, my purpose, as far as my reporting for CSU goes, um, if you guys wouldn't mind saying where you're from and also how many people are watching under each um, name, just so I can have an idea numerically how many people we're reaching and how far out we are going with this, uh, with these sessions. So um, I guess past that, Colby, the floor is yours and take it away. Awesome. Well, I will share my PowerPoint here. All right, um, and so before I, I start, I will put this up here too. Um, you'll notice I have my personal contact information uh, up there. Feel free to, to give me a call or, or shoot me a text or an email. If uh, there are some questions that we didn't get to tonight, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that a lot of the time you don't know you have a question until the, the need arises. And so feel free, uh, when I end tonight, I'll go ahead and put, um, this information back up. The disclaimer that I usually say is I, uh, I'm really, really bad about answering phone numbers that I don't know. And so give me a call, leave a voicemail and I'll call you right back. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, I'll put that up there at the end. If, uh, throughout, uh, anytime you're, you're feeding anything, uh, you can, uh, contact me. So as we go into this, um, We've got a lot of information to cover, and so I'm going to kind of speed through a little bit of um, the the kind of very basic stuff. The first thing that we're going to go over tonight is, is one the function of all the different compartments that a ruminant stomach has. Uh, we probably won't tonight uh, go into necessarily the small and large intestine. Uh, that's a that's a whole nother subject at that point. Uh, we'll chat about it just briefly, but for these next couple slides, that's what we're going to talk about is more so the function and some of the things that happen uh, within each of these compartments of the ruminant stomach. Like I said, I'm, I am incredibly fascinated with ruminant animals because um, realistically, there is a lot of things that make them so, or make ruminant animals so self-sufficient uh, that us 
as monogastrics and, and hogs and uh, chicks and or chickens and everything else don't have the availability to do. And so we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, hopefully y'all can think uh, ruminants are as cool as I do by the time uh, we're done. But moving forward there, uh, that's just a brief example of, of how things are laid out within the ruminant stomach. And then on these slides, I'll have pictures of what the inside um, of these uh, particular uh, compartments look like. And so, uh, first and foremost, the rumen is the first thing that we're going to go into and what a majority of our discussion tonight uh, will be relayed around. Uh, because probably the most activity and the most, uh, I will say, and, and I say this with a little bit of hesitation, a lot of the most important things happen within the rumen. Um, and so for starters, uh, it's the largest compartment within the ruminant stomach. In a, in a cow, let's say, it is 50 to 60 gallons. And so the rumen in and of itself is like putting a whole 50 gallon drum uh, into a cow's belly. And so, and that's a, that's a mature cow. It, it's a gigantic compartment. And then on top of it, what's really interesting is if you look at that top picture, uh, those are the, we call them finger-like projections, the villi, uh, that surround the rumen. And so what those do is actually increase the surface area of the rumen for absorption. And so uh, what the rumen does is there are a ton of little bugs in there, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, uh, a ton of little bugs that have different um, uh, jobs, we'll call it, uh, different bacteria, different fungi, and, and different protozoa that, like I said, all have different jobs. And within there, uh, it, that's an area of fermentation. And so for those of you that have ever had a, a cow or a sheep or a goat bloat, it, it's a ruminal bloat nine times, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, uh, because as you ferment, it releases gas. And so that's where bloat comes from. Um, and then as well, each of those little bugs, uh, those bacteria, fungi, and protozoa all serve a very important role in making volatile fatty acids. And so volatile fatty acids are incredibly important for body function. And so there's three volatile fatty acids that we'll talk about, and that's propionate, butyrate, uh, and acetate. And so uh, one of the more impro uh, important ones is propionate. And so propionate actually serves a pretty vital role in gluconeogenesis. And we talked about that a little bit in the, in the monogastric section uh, of the making of new glucose, which actually helps with... Uh, uh, the energy in, in these ruminant animals. And then um, as well, like I said, just, just bodily function uh, to occur. And so uh, pretty fascinating things that happen within the rumen. We're going to get into that just a little bit later. These are going to be uh, kind of basic overview type things um, of what each of these compartments do. The rumen has the most active, uh, interesting things that happen. And so we move into the reticulum. Uh, and so I guess you, you might also hear, uh, I forgot to mention this on the last slide, but the rumen is also known as the paunch. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I talk about fermentation and I talk about volatile fatty acid synthesis, synthesis and absorption. It's also just a storage unit. Um, the, it's uh, at 50 to 60 gallons, gigantic vat for storage. Um, but like I said, they call that the punch. And so once we move into the reticulum, we call this the, the honeycomb compartment. And so the interesting thing is, is theoretically, the, the rumen and the reticulum kind of in a way are, the, are one compartment. Uh, in short, we call it the rumino reticulum. Uh, there's just a small tissue that separates um, the rumen from the reticulum. And so not a whole lot of separation factor there. Um, I kind of call it like a, like a chain link fence is about all it is not that hard to jump over. Um, the purpose of the reticulum is, is kind of what I would say a protective compartment. As you can see, uh, with those honeycomb features, that's a pretty good place to catch things that we do not want passing through, um, the rest of the digestive system. And so for those of you that have heard about hardware disease, uh, let's say a cow, a goat, a sheep, whatever, happens to eat a nail um, or anything like that. 
this, the purpose of the reticulum is actually to end up catching that. And there's a lot of mechanisms that you can do to uh, um, stop hardware disease. Um, one of which is uh, you can put a magnet bolus down them and that magnet, and that magnet bolus was that will actually reside there within the reticulum and, and catch all those metal particles. Uh, the issue obviously with, let's just say swallowing a nail, we run very, very big, um, risk of that nail poking through um, the the ruminal wall and that uh, obviously is a pretty big issue that's actually how we end up a uh, uh, pretty good way to kill cows uh, essentially but that's what essentially the reticulum does is it's its main purpose is kind of as a, a protective compartment if you will then we get to the omasum and this is what we call the many plies and you can see uh, how all those kind of fold together. There's a lot of plies within the omasum. And so when it's whole, it's actually a very round kind of uh, globes, globe shaped compartment. Um, that is one site. Uh, actually, it's the only site within the, the stomach itself that uh, absorbs water. And so as cattle drink water, that is one site. It's not the major site. That's actually uh, part of the small intestine that, that absorbs a majority of the water. And then further back, even into the large intestine absorbs just a small amount of water as well. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, it's just, again, another further place to break down some feedstuffs into smaller, or smaller particle sizes um, before moving on. Uh, like, yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, it's further breakdown, um, for that. And one thing, actually, that reminds me of another, this is a little bit of, uh, I'll call it, um, kind of anecdotal information here. Um, but kind of one of the interesting things about why ruminants are the way they are, you, you notice, uh, ruminants chew their cud. And, and so the purpose of that is they will actually eructate or excuse me, not eructate, regurgitate um, that food that needs to be further chewed up and, and put into smaller particle sizes. And they regurgitate that from the room. And, and the purpose behind that, again, I'm kind of getting off on a little bit of a tangent, but uh, if you think about uh, the evolution, if you will, of ruminant animals, uh, part of the the idea and one of the theories behind why ruminants are the way they are and how they've evolved into the species they are now is um, before, obviously ruminant animals are a predator or a, uh, what's the opposite of a predator? Um, prey, there we go, prey, um, a prey species. And so they would go out and in the early mornings before predators are actually up and go and try to consume as much food as they possibly could. And specifically thinking about uh, our deer, our elk and things of that nature, they go out and consume as much as they possibly can. And then they go back into hiding to hide away from predators. And then the purpose behind that uh, and why they then regurgitate that back up is they don't actually chew that food up enough to make it small enough particle size to where they can actually further digest it. And so they go back into hiding and then they can actually regurgitate and, and chew up that food into particle or smaller particle sizes while they're in hiding. And so that's kind of the idea of how ruminants came to be and, and one of the theories behind that. And so that's one of the purposes. I know that has nothing to do necessarily with the omasum. And that's why animals chew their cud is it's to break it down into further particle sizes um, to be further absorbed. But moving on from there, uh, like I said, that was a little bit of a side tangent there, but uh, it's interesting information. And so then we get to the abomasum, and this is what we would consider, quote unquote, the true stomach. Um, and so there's hydrochloric acid within, um, a pretty good deal of hydrochloric acid there within uh, the abomasum, and so as well as enzymes uh, that again, further break down that food and specifically lipids. Uh, lipids and fats is what hydrochloric acid will actually turn into more of a detergent factor. Um, and again, it is the final stage before entering the small intestine. So again, hopefully we have enough breakdown with, of those foodstuffs to where we get into the small intestine where the majority of nutrient absorption happens. The small intestine is where a lot of nutrient absorption actually occurs. So those are the functions um, of each of those compartments. 
And so we'll kind of go in, whoa. That's, huh. It's not good. Um, well, a lot of, a couple of my slides uh, seem to not necessarily be there. That's okay, um, because we'll get into some feeding examples here in just a little bit um, in regards to what was gonna be on those slides. So it ends up being okay. You just won't necessarily have a visual. I'll talk more so about it, but luckily it's uh, recorded. So you can go back to it if you wanna go and, and look at some things. Um, we talked about uh, protein and, and fat requirements uh, or energy requirements more so on our uh, last slide or on our uh, on Monday's session. And so today we're gonna dive a little bit more into more of the complex things of mineral and vitamin uh, requirements of cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, minerals are incredibly fascinating, and I'm going to try to keep it fairly brief tonight uh, on, on minerals, because if you want to know everything there is to know about minerals, uh, probably a PhD plus 20 years in the field of, of fully understanding everything there is to know about minerals, because Minerals work together in such a complex and really, really neat way. Um, and so tonight we'll more so just talk about uh, mineral requirements. And so if you notice, I have macro and micro mineral requirements. Uh, micro, another word that we can say is trace minerals. Again, I'm gonna go back to saying that minerals are so important because they serve a gigantic role to a ruminant animal. Um, they serve as a lot of the time as a coenzyme to make certain uh, metabolic pathways occur and, and happen and go to full term. Uh, and then as well, they also serve as a uh, uh, catabolist to also start a lot of the, these different processes. And so for those of you who may not be as familiar with micro and macro mineral requirements, um, macro, doesn't necessarily mean they're more important. They're just needed in a greater quantity. Uh, so our calcium or magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and sulfur, they're needed in a greater quantity to the animal. Micro minerals, however, like I said, not less important. They're just needed in a smaller amount. Um, and so that's talking about cobalt, iron, copper, iodine, uh, manganese, selenium, and zinc. Those are the primary ones that are required for cattle. And so uh, the main thing that we can look at, and especially for those of you who are just feeding show steer projects, uh, show heifer projects, things of that nature, uh, we're gonna look primarily at the growing and finishing cattle column. Uh, for those of you that raise cattle um, and, have, uh, and have bred cows, uh, hopefully these charts can serve a pretty uh, valuable uh, service to you because it's pretty darn important to keep minerals right in our breeding cattle as well. Uh, there's actually a very, very strong correlation behind um, mineral supplementation and um, uh, reproductive soundness. And so hopefully those can be of interest. Like I said, I'm going to focus more so on the growing and finishing cattle. I would imagine that most of us at this point are, are worried about feeding um, our show steers and our show heifers. And so if we look at that, um, our, our mineral requirements, uh, I'm, I guess uh, I'm kind of debating on where I want to go with this necessarily. I'm not going to go into too much depth as per why those requirements are the way they are. Like I said, that'll take quite a bit of time. Uh, but a majority of our mineral supplements uh, that we might feed to cattle um, are already balanced for these particular requirements. And actually a lot of the time they might even be just a shade more. Uh, the issue becomes is if we start supplementing a lot of these minerals, which is not necessarily a bad idea. I actually always encourage, even if you're feeding a show feed specifically to cattle, uh, we'll talk about sheep and goats here in a second, but to cattle, it's not a bad idea to actually have an additional mineral supplement. Uh, and a lot of it actually depends on your ground. Uh, you can get onto the NRCS website and find out actually what your soil um, specifically talking to those with cows, um, what your soil lacks as far as mineral content. 
and, and you can adjust mineral supplementation to that. But again, going back to feeding a show feed, uh, there's already a pretty good vitamin and mineral package in most of these show feeds, but having an additional uh, mineral package such as like a sure champ, um, or uh, a sure champ from Vitafirm or uh, the number one mineral from Showtech, something like that. Essentially what I would call that is cheap insurance. Um, you are absolutely making sure by having that extra vitamin and mineral package, um, you are ensuring that they will not have a deficiency. And mineral deficiencies are where we see a lot of our cattle uh, have hair coat problems. Uh, for instance, if they're actually lacking uh, in let's just say cobalt or iron, uh, and actually even more so than that, copper, um, we can get kind of a dingy, um, nasty kind of a hair coat. And so with that being said, I want to put a little disclaimer to that. I don't want anybody going out to their calves uh, to feed later tonight or in the morning and saying, oh man, I have brown hair in my calves. Obviously we have a copper deficiency. That's not necessarily the case. And especially if you're feeding a show feed, not necessarily anything that be completely worried about. A lot of the time that's just sun bleach. Um, but it's something to pay attention to, especially once you start talking about older cows um, that are completely range driven. Uh, if they start getting a really dingy brown hair coat, and obviously talking about black cattle here, um, a lot of the time that can be a copper deficiency. And so hopefully those um, can help you out there as far as those tables. Now, when we start talking about sheep, this is where it gets quite a bit uh, more complex when it comes to minerals, mainly from the copper standpoint. Uh, one of the most common misconceptions when it comes to sheep is sheep cannot have any copper. Uh, that would be actually pretty incorrect because sheep have to have copper. Um, it's just their tolerance levels are quite a bit lower. And something that's actually quite a bit or pretty interesting about that is it completely depends on your molybdenum content as well as your sulfur content within your feed. If you look up at table five there uh, on this particular slide when it comes to copper allowance, if you have less than one part per million of molybdenum uh, within your feed, uh, then your copper allowance is quite a bit lower because molybdenum and uh, sulfur actually have a pretty vital role as far as how much copper is actually allowed to be absorbed. Uh, both of those minerals actually slow down absorption of copper. And so if you notice again there, if it's above three parts per million of molybdenum, then uh, your copper allowance is quite a bit higher and copper uh, uh, requirement is actually quite a bit higher, so they meet their actual needs. Um, some of the, the things that we can talk about as far as deficiencies uh, of copper when it relates to sheep, uh, especially, I don't know how many people might be in it for, or be raising sheep uh, for wool production, uh, but copper is very, very important to wool production. Uh, as a matter of fact, they start getting really, really stringy uh, type wool. A lot of their wool loses crimp if they are in, in a copper deficiency and their ability to accept dye um, once that wool is actually processed is tremendously lower uh, than if copper is, is in the correct uh, amount. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. And one thing that I wanted to point out is uh, if anybody ever tells you that sheep can't have copper, they're, they're wrong in that assumption. They actually have to have copper. It's just tremendously lower uh, than what it would be for um, a cat or a, yeah, cattle or goats, for instance. And so that's another thing that I would caution. And a question that I actually get quite a bit is, can we feed our sheep goat feed? And, and I would be real hesitant with it because a lot of the time that the goat levels of copper are, are higher. They actually have more of a mechanism within their body to accept and, and digest copper or uh, absorb copper better than what sheep do. And so a lot of the time their copper requirements are quite a bit higher. And so we can start worrying about a toxicity of killing those sheep uh, if, if we start feeding a goat food or a goat feed to our sheep. And one thing that I also want to bring up because I can, uh, I would assume a question that I would personally have by looking at this, um, if we go back and look at cattle, 
our parts per million for cattle when it comes to copper is 10 parts per million. We come over here for sheep and we're above that if our molybdenum content is correct. We're in the 17 to 21 parts per million. And so where I want to put a little bit of a caveat and a disclaimer to that is if you think about the total feed that goes in to uh, a cow or a sheep, obviously cattle eat quite a bit more. So that copper, uh, there, there's quite a bit more copper being ingested uh, into cattle than there would be a sheep. If a sheep were to consume the same amount um, of feed as a cow would, which is nearly impossible, uh, then yes, we would risk copper toxicity because again, parts per million, uh, we're above and beyond what they can handle. Honestly, the other thing about it is too, is if they eat as much as a cow, we have probably bigger problems than copper toxicity. But, uh, and we'll actually talk about that here in just a second. So one thing that, that I, I decided of how I'd take this tonight is I, I, I'm a big example guy. And so to explain some of the mechanisms of how different things happen, I wanted to give some examples of, of why and, and some of the common uh, feeding problems I hear have or I hear people having. I wanted to, to give those examples and explain why that actually happens. And so, for instance, this first one, a very common one. Uh, my calf is only a thousand pounds and he's not heavy enough or fat enough to make weight or look of quality by county fair. And so the first question that I would ask, are they hitting their peak intake? Um, you know, if, uh, for instance, you know, this is the plain and simple answer. If cattle are uh, only weigh a thousand pounds and it's end of June, I always ask people, how much are you feeding? Because if they're only feeding that particular steer 10 pounds a day, they need tremendously more feed than that. So obviously they're not gaining weight. But if you are feeding upwards of that, uh, you know, 26 to 27 pounds of dry matter a day between hay and, and grain, uh, then you're probably okay. And so then we can drop down into another example here. I would check the protein content of your feed. If your calf is not fat enough, then maybe drop the protein content. There is a direct inverse relationship um, between protein content and energy content within a feed. As you start driving up protein content into that 18 to 20% uh, protein, those cattle are getting a lot of skeletal growth. They're getting a lot of growth up, but their energy content is actually quite a bit lower. And then there actually is a relationship where that starts to overturn once you start getting into 22, 23. That is way too high a protein. Uh, you start having bigger issues with that, but energy content does start to rise. But again, you have bigger issues once you get to that point. Um, but again, uh, that's when I would encourage switching to some kind of a finishing ration where our fat content might be in that 6% range. Protein is down clear into the 12s. In contrast to like a sheep or a goat, uh, which I don't hear this question as much when it comes to sheep and goats, just because we want them to stay relatively lean. Um, again, that's another option. You can drop your protein content to try to get fat deposition within those livestock. And then the other thing that, uh, I would also, um, encourage in, in some cases, if you have the availability to get it, uh, and this is where I kind of nerd out just a little bit because a lot of my, uh, master's study was over, uh, ionophores like menensin. And so what menensin is, um, as, a, as a supplement, and most feed yards will actually feed this. Um, and there's other ionophores like lasalacid and things of that nature, but um, it alters how, it, it's an antibiotic, and it does not, it's a feed grade antibiotic, and so it does not count under uh, the veterinary feed directive, because ionophores are not actually used to treat human disease, and so they are exempt from uh, the veterinary feed directive, but how they work is, is originally menensin was used as a coccidiostat, uh, eliminate coccidiosis, and obviously it still does that. But what happened was when they started feeding menensin to cattle to try to uh, eliminate coccidiosis, was they're like, holy cow, these cattle are growing really, really well. And so then they started doing further studies, and what actually menensin does is it alters how the rumen ferments um, feedstuffs. Uh, it actually makes them quite a bit more efficient at digesting carbohydrates and, and starches. And so you get quite a bit better gain 
out of those cattle when feeding an ionophore. Uh, and actually the other thing that you'll notice too, uh, through feeding an ionophore, and I'm not saying this for everybody, um, but if you're in a pinch and trying to gain weight, it's a good option. But uh, another benefit is it's actually a pretty good way to reduce the instance of bloat uh, because what it does is it actually turns cattle more into what I would deem a snacker. Uh, they won't have just a, they don't just go to feed as hard as they normally would, but they'd actually eat more over the course of a day uh, because they ingest that feed a little slower. And then that reduces the incidence of bloat. There's not quite as much starch and, and essentially acid because that's what starch ends up uh, coming into. And we can get into that here in just a little bit as well. Uh, but that starch turns into lactic acid uh, through amylolytic bacteria digestion and turns that in. Uh, and that's how one, we get lactic acidosis and two, that extra fermentation um, turns into gas or bloat. And so you don't have that when you feed uh, an ionophore product. Um, all right. And so now, uh, one thing that we can uh, talk about as well, and this is incredibly common, especially with show livestock, I've noticed. Uh, my animal has gone off feed, okay? Uh, there are a ton of reasons as to why an animal can go off feed. Uh, the big one, worm that animal. Okay, worm them. You should do that. Period. Okay, uh, worming is paramount uh, to success. One in the show ring, and two, just uh, being a good livestock steward. Uh, make sure those those animals are on a pretty consistent worming regimen. If you have done that, another option that you can do is actually feed more times a day. Um, and it kind of goes back to what we talked about with uh, the menensin. One, if uh, you feed more time, you feed less feed more times a day, a lot of the time you can actually get those animals to intake more uh, over the course of, of a day uh, because they're constantly hungry. If uh, you were to just feed me uh, a thing of pudding, I obviously would not be hungry or I would still, excuse me, I would still be hungry. I would constantly want food. Livestock are the same way you can get them to consume more uh, by keeping them hungry. And then the other thing is too, and this is a potential uh, happening uh, with, with animals, uh, specifically ruminants is, is like we talked about earlier. Um, when they intake starch and carbohydrates, that turns into or to acid because there are what's called amylolytic bacteria uh, within the rumen amylolytic bacteria digest starch and digest carbohydrates with that they make lactic acid and so there are uh there's another kind of bacteria that um digests that particular uh lactic acid they're called intermediate acid utilizing bacteria those intermediate acid utilizing bacteria then eat that um i'm i'm saying eat, but they would then uh, digest that lactic acid and then make propionate uh, with that. And so we want propionate. That's a good thing. We want volatile fatty acids because then that goes into the energy content of that animal. That's a good thing. We want that. The issue with it is, is if an animal has a ton of starch at one time, amylolytic bacteria reproduce incredibly fast, very, very fast. Intermediate acid utilizing bacteria have a very slow turnover rate. They reproduce incredibly slow. And so if there is not enough of an intermediate acid utilizing bacteria population, then there's too much lactic acid in the animal, ex facto, they, they get kind of a bellyache, if you will. And so that can be a lot of the times why some animals will go off feed is plain and simple, their stomach hurts. And so sometimes you can feed them more times a day to mitigate the amount of lactic acid that actually gets produced within their stomach and allows that intermediate acid utilizing bacteria to catch up uh, and reproduce to have enough of a population to uh, take up that lactic acid. The other thing that you can do, and I know this is a little bit of, uh, it seems a little funky, it doesn't seem like it makes sense, but increase hay intake. Ruminant animals, um, have to have hay. And, and the reason that 
ruminants can digest hay and grasses and things of that nature, as opposed to what necessarily us or monogastrics do, is I'm gonna go back to bacteria here. They have a population within their gut of bacteria called cellulolytic bacteria uh, that digests cellulose, um, which is the primary uh, nutrient with, or not nutrient, uh, but one of the primary factors within hay. And so as you increase hay, um, what that does is the other, I guess I should back up. The other reason that we have to give them hay is we have to have what's called a scratch factor uh, within the rumen. And so as they intake hay, hay is obviously very coarse. And what it does is basically, for lack of better terms, kind of tickles the rumen. And when it tickles the rumen, that rumen contracts, okay? And so as it's contracting, that's moving that feed stuff around, okay? And uh, one, breaking it up into further feed particles, one, further digesting uh, that particular feed stuff, and then on top of it, as we talked about earlier with carbohydrates producing acid, if you remember back to that original picture, we have those finger-like projections. Acid can actually get caught underneath of some of those finger-like projections, and it sits and just ferments and actually can have the potential of burning through the rumen, uh, if you've ever heard of ruminal ulcers. And so that's part of the issue and, and why animals need hay is if they do not have a large enough hay intake, they're not getting enough scratch factor and that rumen is not contracting to get those feedstuffs moving around and not sitting on the, on that ruminal wall and kind of just burning away. And so again, it goes back to, they might just have a little bit of a belly ache. And one thing that you can do uh, to see if your animal has uh, what we call lactic acidosis um, is a lot of the time their manure will be kind of a, a gray honestly nasty color and it's going to stink. And so if they start having really kind of runny or very gray colored scours, um, then lactic acidosis is probably a pretty good idea. And if they, if you do undergo lactic acidosis, which is actually pretty common with a lot of our show livestock, because we are having such an abundance of concentrated diets or concentrate based diets that, um, you can, uh, I would take them off feed and then increase hay intake, let their gut get back up into what I would deem as normal. And then you can start introducing grain back slowly. Um, and then the other thing, two more things in relation to this, this is actually a pretty complex issue here, but, uh, vitamin ideas that you can have. Um, a lot of the time, if an animal is stressed, they will go off feed. So when you go to a show and they get stressed or, uh, right after weaning, something like that. Uh, a vitamin idea of, of B12 and thiamine, vitamin B12 and thiamine, they're water soluble vitamins. And um, those water soluble vitamins actually serve a very, very important role in like we talked about earlier, gluconeogenesis, the making of new glucose. So when an animal gets stressed, their energy level goes quite a bit down. And so if we can create more glucose within that body, B12 and thiamine does that. They, they, uh, they play a very active role in those particular um, pathways. Um, and so those are, that's pretty important. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that you can have with B12 and thiamine. Us personally, before we ever go to a show, uh, and this actually leads me perfectly into uh, my next subject here, uh, we always give a dose of what we use as probias. Probias is very high in those water soluble vitamins. Uh, which a lot of the time are low at times of stress. And then on top of that, it keeps our gut happy. Uh, microbial populations within the room and a lot of the time will deplete under stress. And so a probias has a lot of active cultures with those particular um, rumen microbes that they need to properly digest feed. And so if, uh, for those of you that may have heard happy wife, happy life, well, to ruminants, it's happy rumen, happy life. If you can keep their rumen, uh, the microbiome within their rumen happy, you should be, uh, that animal will be successful and uh, they'll feel right. And so those are a couple big things there. I know that was a lot of information all in one, but those are uh, some ideas for you there. And so this one, this one's going to be pretty quick. Um, 
this one will be pretty fast here. My animal's gotten too fat. Uh, and particularly, this is, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. It, it's pretty common with all of our three ruminant species. Uh, they get too fat. We've got one that, that just eats like crazy, uh, is an easy doer, has gotten too fat to look the part uh, for our show. One, if, if you're starting to notice one get too fat, increase your protein content is one, uh, one thing that you can do. Another thing that actually I would personally more so recommend because fat can be our best friend um, because a lot of the time with these show livestock with that fat, we can create the illusion of some extra width, some extra muscle, some extra muscle shape. So fat can be our best friend there. Uh, but you have to do it correctly with a good exercise regimen. Uh, specifically, let's just talk about sheep. With the sheep, I don't mind getting them a little chubby right off the bat because then we hit them hard with exercise. I keep feed intake the same and then hit them hard with exercise to where their energy levels are still up to where they can exercise. Um, and it's a lot like a bodybuilder, for instance. Uh, if you ever talk to a bodybuilder, a lot of those guys are eating somewhere around 5,000 to 6,000 calories a day or even more. Um, and so it looks like we got a chat here too. Um, I'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, kind of won't let me open. Oh, there we go. I'll open up. I'll get to the chat here in just a second. It won't let me open it up. But uh, a pretty heavy exercise regimen uh, to where, again, we, we talk about our bodybuilder. They are putting on a ton of muscle, but they're eating 6,000 calories a day. But they have a pretty heavy exercise regimen. A lot of the time, uh, especially with sheep, that's what we want them to look like as a bodybuilder. And so uh, it doesn't matter. And, you know, they can be a little too fat as long as you're exercising hard enough. And the other thing that I'll get to here before I get to that question, uh, I'm guessing it's a question with it being in the chat box. Uh, uh, it was just someone saying where they're from, Colby, so you're good. Oh, okay, perfect. All right. Never mind then. Um, but the other thing is too, and for those of you that might have uh, tuned into the monogastric stuff last week, we talked about beta agonists a little bit. And I'm going to put the, the um, disclaimer to this that beta agonists are not the end-all be-all. They are not for everybody, okay? As a matter of fact, Zilmax is illegal now. Well, Zilmax is kind of a complicated issue, but we don't need to get into that part. Uh, but one of the, the beta agonists that is still available is, is a product called Optiflex for cattle. Um, and so if you need to add more muscle or more muscle shape, Optiflex is an option. And, and that's what it is. It's a beta agonist that repartitions nutrients uh, to be not stored towards fat deposition. It stores them towards muscle deposition uh, and essentially makes muscle cells undergo hypertrophy. They intake more water and they actually grow. And so we can add more muscle shape there. The reason that I put a disclaimer to these is you can mess up structure pretty good with, with these. And that's actually why Zilmax was illegal there for a while is because packers would not take cattle that were fed Zilmax because they had too many issues with uh, mobility. If you feed those beta agonists in too aggressive of, of a manner, then uh, those cattle are putting on so much weight and so much muscle at a time, their mobility is pretty hindered. And so I, I say, I use that as an option. Okay. I'm just putting out options, but it is not for everybody. They have to be very sound structured and actually pretty fat before you have to worry about um, the use of a beta agonist. But like I said, it's an option. And I think it's pretty important that you understand how it works before you use it. And so with that being said, those are the examples that I have. Um, and so I'll open it up. We're uh, nearing the, the 50 minute mark here. And so I wanted to leave it open for plenty of questions. If you guys have it, uh, I left it fairly. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that we didn't cover. And like I said, I'm sure a lot of the time you don't even know you have a question until it arises. And so I threw a whole bunch of information out tonight, uh, but there could even still be a whole lot more covered. Uh, but hopefully you guys got something, something out of these series. Um, a lot of the things that we covered tonight, I kind of built off of um, last or on, I built off of Mondays. 
uh, lecture. And so uh, for those of you that haven't seen Mondays, feel free to get on to the YouTube link and watch that as well. Uh, but yeah, like I said, hopefully everybody got something out of this. And with that said, I will um, open it up to questions.